First tonight, a disease you can catch walking right here in the Quantock Hills. Tiny ticks carry Lyme disease. And while it is treatable, a number of sufferers are angry about the way they're being looked after. Instead, they're travelling to America for expensive treatment that can be dangerous, even potentially fatal. Our health correspondent Matthew Hill has the story. In places like the Quantocks, Lyme disease is on the increase, spread by ticks. For sufferers, it's a terrible and debilitating illness. My vision's blurry. I've always got a sort of low-grade headache. I don't really feel safe in my own body. There's no vaccine, and testing is complicated and not an exact science. We all have to accept that there is no perfect test for Lyme disease. I've had my own blood looked at by the country's leading expert to find out just what patients are going through with surprising results. To a normal patient, take getting that result, would they not think, oh, I've got Lyme disease? I think that they might well do that. But some tests are convincing people to travel here to America for expensive and potentially dangerous treatment. So I've been investigating whether the doctors divided by the Atlantic can ever reach a compromise. How is it good for patients not knowing who to believe? It's terrible for patients. They're caught in the middle. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a sad situation. We don't know what to think. We're just caught in the middle of this, this war, effectively above our heads, and we're actually the victims of this. The Quantocks, England's first area of outstanding natural beauty, 40 square miles where walkers can get close to the wildlife. But not everything here is friendly. It's such a significant place for people to come and enjoy the countryside, you know, like the Scouts, like Duke of Edinburgh, like the Ramblers, like uh, Ten Tools training, all those sort of groups. You know, they need to be made aware that when they're in this sort of environment, they're in sort of tick country in a sense. Mm. Um, the TikToks. The TikToks, exactly. Tim Russell was a ranger here for years. He agreed to show me around and says the number of ticks is on the increase, so people need to take precautions. And presumably, if it's just if you just brush it like that, is that how you get them? Yeah, they yeah. Just jump I mean, on. yeah. For me, for example, now just walking past like that. Yeah brush onto your trousers. Yeah. Um, uh, one of the things we suggest is to wear light coloured clothing because ticks are generally quite dark coloured. So if you have sort of light coloured clothing, you can actually see a tick on you and just sort of brush it off. So best not to wear shorts then if you're... Yeah, I mean, yeah. some of the advice we give as rangers here in, in this open countryside area is not to walk around through the Quantocks in shorts and sandals. Wear boots, leggings if possible, and also long trousers and keep your arms covered. A very simple uh, suggestion for people is stick on the paths. Ticks live off the blood of wild animals, but if they attach to humans, the bacteria they carry can cause Lyme disease, which often begins with a rash and flu-like symptoms and can even lead to neurological problems. The estimated number of Lyme disease cases in England is between two and 3,000 a year, according to Public Health England, lower than in the US, although some campaigners here believe the real figure is much higher. I've come to meet one campaigner in Dorset. She says they're not being taken seriously and that testing, treatment and knowledge of Lyme here is not as good as it should be. Hi. Hi, nice to meet you, Natasha. Hi, Hi. good, thank you. How are you coming? Natasha Metcalf knows all about this. She first became ill when she was a teenager. When I was 16 years old, I experienced night sweats and terrible concentration. Um, suddenly couldn't concentrate at school. Very, very swollen glands, um, but it was never picked up then, sadly. And I managed to sort of recover myself just by being in bed a lot. The second time I was 19 and the same thing happened again. I couldn't concentrate almost overnight. Everything became very fuzzy. And then managed to spend about nine months in bed and recovered myself again somehow. 21 it happened again and the last time was 24. 
and um, in 2008, and I haven't managed to bounce back since. Extremely ill. Um, she's had days when she hasn't uh, managed to get out of bed. It's been very worrying indeed. Natasha's family have taken her to more than 40 doctors and spent £75,000 trying to solve the problem. They now believe they have a solution, long-term antibiotics. These are my um, medication I take on a daily basis. Um, here are the two antibiotics I'm taking at the moment. Relatively low doses at the moment because I'm quite sensitive. Along with them, I'm taking a very high quality probiotic, which obviously is very important to protect the gut with long-term antibiotic therapy. She takes these drugs after she was finally diagnosed with Lyme disease in America, following tests at a private laboratory there. None of this came cheap. For Lyme and, and my doctor in America so far, we totaled it up at about 11,000. That was from one visit and subsequent consultations for a year, phone Over the consultations. Phone. Yes. Yeah. But like many in her group, she feels she has no choice. She says her long term illness needs long term antibiotics. I'm not being offered any treatment here because I've done the psychiatric route, I've done the ME route, I'm still sick. Everyone has the same story. And there's a big divide between those who can afford to go abroad and those who can't. Natasha went back to the US for more treatment. We'll catch up with her later. I wanted to find out what the experts here think. Are there any downsides? Well, I've come to see the top doctor in the country in charge of fighting Lyme disease here at Portland Down. That's Dr. Tim Brooks. He's recently taken over responsibility for Lyme. The rule here, treat early with a short course of antibiotics. Some people may benefit from a second course, he says, but long-term use can be dangerous. Once you've treated the infection for long enough to eradicate the organism, any additional antibiotics will not make any difference. What they will do is encourage the growth of other infections resistant to those antibiotics within you. And you might, for example, develop a fungal infection, what we call a super infection, that can be extremely serious in some cases. How serious in some cases? There are reported deaths for people who've been given uh, long-term treatment with intravenous antibiotics. And that's related to Lyme disease? And that was treatment for Lyme disease. I've come to the US to find out if British patients here should be worried. Natasha put me in touch with a doctor in San Francisco. Her own declined to be interviewed. Hi. Oh, hi. 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 Happy Hill. Hi. Nice you. to meet you. Let's uh, go into the consultation room. Raphael Stricker says he's treated more than 2,500 people for Lyme disease. So any treatment can be harmful. So there's a risk-benefit ratio, basically. So you have to weigh the risk of this type of treatment versus the benefit for people who have chronic, debilitating disease. What evidence is there that long-term antibiotics work? Uh, the studies that have been done on long-term antibiotics are limited. There is at least one study, and in fact there are others, that show that for neurologic Lyme disease, it may take between 6 and 12 months of intravenous therapy to get those patients better. So definitely longer than what's recommended by the infectious disease uh, experts. Can you cite me the author of that? You're talking to him. <laughs> Natasha was also in California for treatment, and we asked her to film for us. Ironically, we've just driven past a huge billboard saying, protect yourself from ticks. Um, with a big picture of a tick on it. So clearly they are doing their bit here to raise awareness. Patients like Natasha say they're benefiting from the treatment doctors like Raphael Stricker are prescribing. One thing that's been um, almost strange for me, and, but also a relief, is being surrounded by people in the IV room in the clinic who are going through exactly the same thing and who've also had such a tough time being diagnosed and it's taken them years and years to get the help that they need as well. And it's been such a relief being able to talk to them about their journey and their stories. Natasha may feel it's working for her here, 
but with the warnings I'd heard from Porton Down, I decided to take a look at the American tests being paid for by hundreds of British patients. So who should patients like Natasha believe? Well, we've decided to carry out our own little experiment to test the tests. Back in the UK, two colleagues and I had blood taken and sent to the Porton lab and to a private lab in the US called Igenex, the same one Natasha used. As far as we know, none of us have ever had Lyme disease. So we're, what we're expecting is that they should all come back the same from both the NHS and from Igenex. Testing is based on finding antibodies to the Lyme bacteria. It's only part of the diagnostic picture, but it's crucial. Now this project concluded in January of this year. And at a conference in London last year on Lyme disease, one campaigner explained why. All the tests vary, and I think we all have to accept that there is no perfect test for Lyme disease. But still the position stands that people can go to a private laboratory overseas and get a test. That test might not be specific to Lyme disease, and the poor patient then has an official looking piece of paper that says they have Lyme disease, and the doctor back in the UK doesn't know what to do with it. Natasha was also at the conference, so a chance to catch up after her four and a half weeks of antibiotics in the States. Still got a long way to go. I felt really good out there having IV treatment, but obviously can't stay there forever. So, yeah, it's um, had to come home, but it's, I'm still under the care of, of the doctor. Natasha has since returned to the US for more treatment. This is where it all happens for your Lyme test, is that right? It is. Back at Porton Down, our test results were in. From the three of us tested, one of us was given the all clear by Igenix and Porton. And you can see, if we look at this one, this is um, James and it's completely negative. My producer also came back negative in the UK. This is Dickens, and if you look at it here, there's a very faint band there, and it is less dark than that control band there. It's present, but it's negative. But this came back as positive from Igenix, which has a lower testing threshold. They do stress results must be looked at alongside symptoms and history. Any British patient seeing that result from Igenix, what, what would you imagine they would do as a result of seeing a positive? Well, I think the problem with the way in which it's presented is that it looks like it's positive and it's stated as being a real positive. Our difficulty in any test of this sort is setting what we call the cutoff, the difference between a non-specific random reaction, the background noise, and the true response. We think that actually there isn't an absolute right or wrong in any of these things. They all have to be taken into context of the patient's symptoms. For me, the test was negative from Porton. There is nothing at all to see. But according to Igenex, I should also see a doctor as I could have Lyme disease. They've given you uh, a positive to an antigen called P31, which we don't measure in the UK. Uh, another protein, and a strong positive to one called P41 here, which has a problem in the sense that around half of normal people will have antibodies to that, whether or not they've ever seen Lyme disease. So it's meaningless, really? So it's unhelpful, rather than meaningless. Igenix told us there is no perfect test, but the P31 is useful and proven for showing up long-term Lyme disease. And they tell patients my type of result would need more tests. No wonder then that this is confusing and difficult for worried patients. They may feel let down in the UK, but is their faith in America misplaced? Aren't you offering a lot of these patients false hope on little evidence of, of it actually working? They should be coming up with better treatment for these patients who are sick and who can't get treated because of what they're doing. Um, I would say that having seen 
literally thousands of patients now with Lyme disease who get better when you treat them, um, that I would err on the side of treating. And I don't think it's false hope to make patients better. I think that's what we as physicians try to do. Lyme disease still divides medical opinion, but Igenex and Porton are now talking about sharing data, and Dr. Brooks wants definitive research into the illness. I don't think we can go on with a system where different laboratories have different results and end up causing confusion to patients, different management criteria for patients, and leave some patients treated inappropriately and other patients who needed to be treated being missed. New guidelines are also on their way for patients and doctors, which some feel are long overdue. And I think where we would agree there's a deficiency is that the guidance is not necessarily friendly to the broader community, and it's not necessarily all in one place that makes it very easy to put together a set of, of pathways which a general practitioner faced with a patient for the first time can follow to ensure that nothing is missed. The proof, of course, will be when patients like Natasha start trusting the system again. I feel like we get told that we're these crazy activists, but we don't know what to think. We're just caught in the middle of this, this war, effectively above our heads, and we're actually the victims of this.